Welcome to the Echo Podcast, where we discuss how our hearts and minds can be an echo of God's heart and mind and what that even means in this world. We're Pastor Dan Sinkhorn and Adrian Terulo from Shiloh Church of Jasper, Indiana, and we've gone pulpit to podcast. We hope you enjoy today's episode where we talk about the book of Romans. So Pastor Dan, the book of Romans is so dense and so filled with good truths and um you've done was it a six week sermon series on romans um and we just finished it this past weekend so lots of really really good stuff and as i was prepping for this podcast episode i was just like man where to begin because there is so much like It's like you pull back one layer and there's just another layer. It's like this big onion, right? Yeah. Um, But Paul has done such a great job writing this book and helping us like understand our faith and what that means. Um, And so I thought that I would start with a little story from our young adult small group last night that we met. We're in Romans chapter six, which is back a little bit from what we've talked about recently in church, but... It just got so much to the core of the heart and like specifically the core of like my heart, you know, individually. I don't know. It just it just really stuck with me, the conversation that we had. And I thought it was so good that maybe it would be podcast worthy. So um, let's do it. We're doing a right now media study thing. What do you call it? Series, I guess. A study series um, on the book of Romans. And it's just chapters one through six. We're almost through it. It's an 11-week study. And um, J.D. Greer is the guy who's doing it. And last night, he talked about um, sin and what it means to, like, be a slave to sin. Um, That's a word that we use a lot in Christianese is, like, being a slave to sin or being a slave to God. It's, like, two choices. Um, But J.D. was saying that there are four, like, general categories of sin i guess Mm -hmm. um for i don't know exactly what he called them but subjects maybe um like different flavors of sin i guess if you will so there's chocolate and vanilla no um (laughs) (laughs) but there was four and he said they are control power approval and pleasure Hmm. and that when we choose sin it probably falls into one of those categories and he he invited us to look into our own hearts and see which one of those we kind of are a slave to. And I guess when you say it, I don't know, that sounds a little weird to be a slave to one of those things, but he said when one of those things becomes so central in your life that you feel like you need that thing to be happy, like your happiness is so dependent on it, then you are enslaved to it because it's like the choices that you make are to feed that that thing. And anytime you're feeding one of those things, you're not worshiping God. Yeah. So that, that was just huge. Um, he said for people who, who are a servant, I guess, to like control, that would be like when things don't go according to how you think they should, it just totally like freaks you out. Like you just... Um, do all of these different things. And he went into examples and he said, or like you want, you want people to act like you expect them to, or you want them to. And when they don't, then your, your whole plan is like derailed and you just kind of lose it. He said, for those who serve power, that would be like wanting influence or recognition. I thought of social media when Mm -hmm. he said that, like, that's huge. How Mm -hmm. many followers do I have? How much control do I have? You know, well, I guess I shouldn't use that because that was the last one, but power that was power um and then approval like seeking the approval of other people and then pleasure um so like things that please us like sensually or like good food um alcohol that kind of thing like things that make you feel good like the creature comforts Mm -hmm. um so i don't know we were talking about like leadership you and i before this podcast and how important it is leadership and you actually talked about that in one of I think the last um yeah the last one in the series is about dealing with discord perfect because that's Paul's last admonition to the church in Rome is you got to deal with discord 
Yeah. And, and it's implicit that you can't deal with it without leadership. And it takes someone strong in that leadership position, which is actually what I thought too of this that JD was talking about is like, if you have a leader who's serving these other things aside from God, then they're going to make decisions that cause discord and um, disruptions. And they're just not truly seeking God. Um, I don't know. I just thought it was so good. Like those four, just spelling it out like that kind of simplified it for me. Well, you were, uh, you're doing really well so far. I mean, I'm, thinking I could probably just leave and go do something else because you got this. <laughs> well, what what you've done so far that is, is, is so impressive to me is, is you've explained the nature of sin really well. And I understand you're drawing on J.D. Greer, but, but, you know, I couldn't find a better way, I think, to describe what sin really is because, you know, a lot of people uh, have been – wounded by Christians who seem to have a list of sins and you have all of them and they don't have any of them, you know, and that, that's just stupid. Right. So, <laughs> you know, obviously a lot of Christians out there that have said dumb things that have made it worse for people who were thinking about trying to find out what a Christian is and why they should be one. But you've given a definition that people can wrap their minds around, you know, because because sin is the thing that separates us from God. And his way of sort of quantifying and qualifying sin in those categories is pretty good, you know, because because it really does come down to those things as a rule. And uh, I support that idea. And, you know, I have a tendency to, to overly simplify it as just saying, you know, vanity and sanity, you know, or pride because, because pride is basically putting yourself above anything else, whether it's other people or even God, you know? So my simplification is not very helpful to people because it doesn't break it down that well. And I think Greer has broken it down in a way that makes it something you can practically address and so I'm really grateful that you shared that because I hope folks will keep that in mind when, when they're thinking about their life with God is, is God, you know, God is, is, uh, is always going to get pushed aside for the sake of those things, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, so that's very good. And I appreciate that because something that I was hoping you would mention is your small group. Because you can't do six 30-minute sermons on the Book of Romans and expect to have accomplished anything. Yeah. And I even op opened the last one in the series by saying, hey, if you think you know Romans now, you, you don't. We barely scratched the surface here. You need to be in a small group. And I even sort of implied that I knew one. <laughs> and uh, with a certain redheaded youth leader in it, you know, and I just said, well... <laughs> There's, there's groups doing this, and that's the way to do it because you need to spend long hours of, of study and discussion in this book to really grasp the, the importance of it because the Bible is a, co a complete work in itself, but there are certain parts of it that are kind of essential if you want to take your faith life to a new level and, and to really understand what it means to be a Christian. And to be able to explain to others what it means to be a Christian, you got to read Romans. Yeah. Because that's the best case for Christianity in the entire Bible. You know, and, it, and it's written from the perspective of a guy who has his heart set on saving his Jewish brothers and sisters. And he's recognized that if he can win over the Gentiles, it will be integral to his plan of salvation for the Jews. You know, and he says in so many words, I'm doing this with the Gentiles because they will listen to me. And maybe if it gets under the skin of the Jews who have ignored me, we can get something done to save them too. So he's very deliberately laying out his case with the Jews in mind, even though he's trying to teach and convert 
non-Jews and it gives us a gospel for the ages, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's brilliant. I don't remember where I heard this. It might have been you in the sermon or it might have been this small study. I don't know. I can't remember. But they said that I think it was Harvard Law used to use the Book of Romans to teach them how to make a good defense. Yeah. Yeah. That is so cool to me. I've heard that too over the years. And I suspect that you could have heard it from multiple places at this point. Probably. You know. But it's so cool. Like just to say, hey, this is a Loctite like defense of christianity like that's so cool it just gets right to the heart of it and we've now been meeting for 10 weeks next week will be week 11 and we have had over an hour long discussion on this book every single time we've met and i still feel like we're just scratching the surface oh yeah like it's just there's so much there to digest yeah it would be impossible to try to like tie it up with a bow in one or two podcasts Um, but yeah, highly recommend a deep dive there. Um, I think it was so cool that Paul was using that back then to speak to the Gentiles, but it's also so completely relevant in our world today yet as the living word, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I just wanted to bring up too, last night, your daughter made an awesome point and I have to give her credit for it. But Bethany, um, Pastor Dan's daughter is a middle school guidance counselor. And so she's thinking a lot about like mental health, mental illness in her day-to-day job. And so her brain automatically connected the four of those categories of sin to four different um, like mental illnesses. Mm. And I thought that was so cool. She laid it out and she said, so if someone is um, basically like worshiping or serving this control, like they need control, that can manifest to anxiety. Hmm. It was cool. And then she said, if someone is, you know, seeking power all the time, that can lead to narcissism. Yeah. And then approval. So constantly wanting other people's approval to be happy can lead to depression. Because ultimately you're not going to get that from everyone. You're going to be constantly seeking, trying to find, but never getting there. Yeah. And then that other one, pleasure, she said, can lead to mania. Like you're always seeking to feel good and feel comforted. And I just like, like brain explosion. That was so cool. Good job, Bethany. That was brilliant. Yeah. So I thought I would share that with, you know, the whole world who's definitely <laughs> listening to this podcast. Well, okay. Um, since since <laughs> since she went there and you went there vicariously from her, I'll tell you what I was thinking as you were sharing that earlier. Um, as you know, I'm very well read on the uh, topic of the Enneagram from a Christian perspective. Um, And Enneagram is, is there's just, I could do a whole episode on that. And there's other people out there doing Enneagram podcasts. So we're not going to go there. All I can say is, is that the Enneagram is uh, sometimes in some circles, maligned as something that's not Christian, but it really is neither Christian nor sec. It's, it just, it just is, Mm -hmm. you know, that's kind of like saying grass is Christian or it's not, you know, (laughs) no grass is just grass, you know, and, and the Enneagram is like that. It's not something demonic. It's not something, um, that has some spiritual overtones. It's, it's just a method of evaluating personality types and their tendencies and when you use that tool to understand yourself and others better it just helps you to live out your christian discipleship better and to be more at peace with yourself and guess what when you describe those four characteristics of sin and then my daughter's four characteristics of of uh, psychological dis-ease I can tell you that it easily manifests on the Enneagram. And it's very simple to see how each of the personality types in the Enneagram has a negative side and a positive side. Basically, if you're living into who you are in a good way, then you have to certain tendencies that you will manifest. If you're living in, in a sort of hostility to your personality type, then it'll have negative manifestations. And those negative manifestations are all there. And actually, 
without being an advocate for the Enneagram, because we're talking about Romans here, what I've learned even most recently about the Enneagram is, is that it has certain universal truths in it because it just turns out there are certain universal truths. <laughs> and those four essences of sin or those four natures of sin, they're, they're really, that's pretty universal. Mm -hmm. and, and so you could talk to a secular psychologist who's an atheist and, and absolutely not a Christian believer or any kind of believer, and they would tell you that these four kinds of disordered thinking lead to negative outcomes because it's just true yeah because grass is grass it, <laughs> it isn't good bad or whatever it just is what it is and so you know it's important to keep that in mind you know um i don't have any idea how i could neatly tie that back to romans except to say that without being able to credit romans for this truth i do believe Nevertheless, the, the Bible overall has informed me that the creator of everything that is, was, and ever will be was and is entirely mindful of how it works, you know? And many, many times people who have no interest in a relationship with God or or any, you know, benefit to the world of, of Christian Judeo mindset you know they will uncover these truths all the time they'll they'll figure out how to make a more powerful microscope that looks even deeper into the unseen world of microbiology and all this kind of stuff and and they make discoveries and you have to say to yourself well you you discovered it you didn't make it you know you mm -hmm. found it but it wasn't lost you know, you, yeah. you stumbled onto it, but it was always there. You know, see, that's the thing that vanity does to us, right? We, we have a tendency to assume that because we found something or we became, you know, more capable of seeing or hearing or interacting with something that already existed, that somehow our discovery made it come into existence. But that's just not true. You know, yeah. it already existed. It was already there. The atom was already there. We just didn't know how to see it. And then once we figured out how to see it, we then figured out how to dissect it and understand it and dive deeper into it. And this is this is one of the amazing things about human nature is it's quite godlike in many ways. You know, humans are very godlike. It's why we say we're made in the image of God. But the thing that we can't resist is giving ourselves credit for all of these things, you know? And, and so that's back to my vanity and sanity argument, you know, that pride says that, you know, I did this. No, you didn't. It was here before you, and it will be here after you. And, you know, you may have played a part in some way or another of discovery or, or uncovery or whatever, but at the end of the day, it already was, you know? And, and so, yeah, you know, Paul's argument about sin is, is in many ways more practical and it's tied to his understanding of the law that the Jews practiced. And the, the, the funny thing is, is that in Jewish tradition of that day, practicing the law was the way of righteousness. And so the extent to which you lived out that righteousness determined your sort of personal holiness. And, and, uh, and people were presumptuous enough to say that if they had attained a certain level of, of holiness, they should even wear badges of honor that reveal to everybody that they are superior in their personal holiness. In other words, the the rabbis and the Levites and the various people who were assigned to this uh, holier than the rest cro uh, crowd, you know, they, they dress differently. And all this stems from the law of Moses. And it comes from back in those days when, when God separated them for these purposes. But by the time of Jesus and the apostle Paul, 
the idea that the law was maintained better by some than others had become, in essence, sin. And so the law became a source of sin. And the application of the law became a source of sin, mm. you know. And so this is what Paul's driving at. He's trying to help people understand that your your vanity and your pride, your devotion to your flesh, you know, these are the things that separate you from God. But it's, I don't know how to explain this. It's bigger than that, but it's actually not that complicated, <laughs> you know. But that's kind of like saying, you know, a 40 ton wrecking ball is not complicated, but you ain't going to move it <laughs> without some pretty heavy machinery. Right. So what I mean by that is, is that this there's there's this very simple thing that you can say about sin. And it is that God is, was and always will be first. God was here before everything God created. God will be here after everything God created is gone. The Bible is very explicit about that. Therefore, to diminish God's role in creation and in the human condition is a sin against God. It, it's a violation of something as central as as the sun is to our daily lives, you know, every day we depend on the sun. It doesn't actually rise and fall. The earth rotates <laughs> and we are either on the shadow side of the earth or we're on the sunny side of the earth. But the sun remains there in that same spot. Millennia after millennia, you know, and every living thing on this planet depends on that. And to say that the sun is a figment of the imagination, that it's not real, that it doesn't, you know, or that the sun is irrelevant. Why, why should we even care about the sun, you know? All right, say that if you go to the beach without sunscreen, you know, all day, right? Especially a fair-skinned person like you. How's that going to work out? Terribly, you know? been there many times. Yeah, yeah. So, so you can't deny the sun. It is, and, and it does occasionally remind you painfully, that it is, was, and always will be ready to burn you to a crisp if you allow yourself to disrespect it. And, and you know, even as we're going through the changing of the seasons, we have to repre represent, we have to respect, rather, the relationship we have to the sun, you know, because the days get shorter and, and our nights get longer and the temperature gets cooler and, and you know, we have changes in the weather that affect our lives and we long for the return of the sun. So in many respects, we have more reverence for the sun than we do for God. And that's really the point that Paul wants to make, which is why he will say in him, God, we live and move and have our being, you know, that, that, we it's easier for us to understand the important relationship we have with the sun than it is for understanding our relationship with God. And that's S U N people in case you're missed, you know, if you're dialing in right at the last minute or something, you might think I'm talking about the son of God, but, but I'm saying that humans, regardless of their religious orientation and their spiritual beliefs, acknowledge the sun that rises every morning and sets every night and our entire lives are de dependent on our relationship with that orb in the sky we don't have a problem with that but we have a problem with the one who created it <laughs> yeah i mean some people have a problem with the sun s-u-n especially mm -hmm. this time of year they're like it gets dark so early yeah. Rawr, you yeah. know <laughs> But yeah, it, it's our lives are. So yeah, and then they blame on it, it on the government because they <laughs> changed the time. Like, right? You know, it really doesn't matter what time it says on the clock; the days are shorter. Yeah, they just are. <laughs> you know? Anyway. Yeah. And and again, I, I'm 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 trying to play back everything we've talked about so far, and I'm wondering if this is making sense. But the 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 fact that. 
Paul wants us to understand like some really core things about the nature of humanity's relationship with God. And Paul wants us to understand above all else that we should have a reverence and dependence upon God, a reverence for and dependence upon God that far exceeds our reverence and dependence upon the solar mechanism called the sun S U N that comes up every day and goes down every night. Like, like, you know, first and foremost, you have to have a higher degree of reverence for God than most of us give. And what's ironic about the law is that people practice the law in a very selfish way. They, they refuse to give God credit for being who God is. They are insistent upon putting God in a box. And in the literal sense, the Jews put God in a box, in a tabernacle. And what's really funny is, is that when God conceded to do that, it was a sort of forecasting of how God would eventually redeem the world because he would put himself in a tomb, you know, mm -hmm. and then emerge from it. That, that God is so much more than we can fully comprehend and so entirely beyond our, our comprehension as the creator of everything that is, was, and ever will be. And yet that same creator descends to the earth resides in a place called the holy of holies and says i'll stay right here so you don't get hurt by my immense presence because you can't stand to be in my presence you know and then i'm going to ask you to go through certain procedures so that you can enter my presence and we can sort of renew this reconciling relationship that we have which is the old testament law and so God comes up with these sort of, of procedures, um, not only as a means to an end that we can understand, which is reconciliation between God's people and God, but it's also a means to an end because he's trying to, he's trying to instruct them. It's like he's trying to completely rebuild the race of Adam from the ground up, you know, from Abraham up, you know, he's, he's gonna, he, he starts with, with, uh, you know, obviously Adam and, and his sons and, and daughters, you know, but, but we go through Noah and we go through all this process of God sort of preserving this race of Adam. But it's like when they are taken into captivity in Egypt, the gods of the earth have like really screwed them up you know, like, like really, really mess them up, you know? And, uh, and so when they come out of Egypt, God says, okay, you know, we got to hit the reset button here, but this is going to take a long time. And so God th goes through this process of, of kind of re-educating generation after generation to understand the true nature of their relationship with God. And then we get what we call the law of Moses or the rules that the people lived by. But then the first thing the people do is secular humanize it. They expand it and, and they, they, they assume that, that God's mystery and God's supreme nature and authority needs our help. Mm but we end up subjugating the law and by consequence subjugating God, you know, cause we're like, we're like a people who are saying exactly the same thing Satan said to Adam and Eve, which is, did God really say that? Did he really mean that? Or are you just, hearing him wrong or is he being deceptive <laughs> right and so what did they do after they got 10 commandments 
they gradually disseminate them into hundreds of questions like that. Did God really mean this? And what are we supposed to do on Tuesdays when the moon is full? And what about when moss grows on this side of your house, but not that side of the house? And, and you know, that's what they did. Yeah. So the, by the time of Jesus, he said, look, look, I, I'm here to confirm and fulfill the law. But when he means law, he means the foundational relationship between God and people, which is actually just five of the Ten Commandments. Because the other five are about our relationships with other people, which, by the way, Jesus said was the heart of the law. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. That would be the first five. Love your neighbor as yourself. That would be the second five of the Ten Commandments. Oh, wow. Right? That's cool. So God, through Jesus, affirms his foundational law which is about our relationship with God. And Jesus did not come to full, uh, fulfill 614 laws or 613 laws or whatever. He, he didn't come to fulfill those. He came to fulfill the law. And God is the law. And it's the, it's the law of God's righteousness. And it's the law of his holiness. He's that giant 40-ton wrecking ball that you can't move. So you have to feel, you have to feel your way around it. You have to find a way to live with that truth that this, this is the law that God is the law and his righteousness is righteousness. And, and so then when we get to Romans, Paul's trying to explain that to people. He's trying to say, look, you have tried and tried and tried to win at the game of righteousness in such a way that you come out like with a prize, you know, like it's some kind of context, context, contest. (laughs) I'll tell you what happened there. My mind was racing ahead of my mouth because I was thinking of context because one of the foundational issues during Paul's time, I'm digressing, but I hope this is helpful. One of the foundational issues during Paul's time is the difference between Greeks and Jews. All right. So I've mentioned this a few times in the sermon series that you have to understand that in the Bible, there is a tendency to speak of the de- the separation between Gentiles and Jews. But the Bible also uses the term Greeks, which basically And, you know, if you're a scholar listening to me, I understand what your argument will be, but this is not for you. We are talking about basically the same thing, that the Jews are people of the Abrahamic covenant and Gentiles are everybody else. So in the same context, during the New Testament era, Jews and Greeks are like that. Jews are people of the Abrahamic covenant and the Hebrew tradition. Greeks are people of a very worldly secular tradition. They're they're the secular worldview. And that transcends all the way to the very moment we're living in right now. There is a biblical worldview and there's a secular worldview. And that's essentially the difference between Jews and Greeks. Or in our times, the difference between Christian biblical worldview and and a secular worldview. And what do the Greeks value? They value skinniness and beauty. They value sensuality. They value, what are those four things you were just talking about? Mm -hmm. They are central to the Greek ideology. And that Greek ideology is pervasive in our culture right now. In fact, so much of our archeology, span archeology, architecture, so much of our architecture in our houses of government and everything is modeled after Greek ideology, Wow, you know, and, and, uh, because Greek thinking was the height of secular humanism. And that is in a way something that we can kind of understand why people celebrate it because it's true that it represents the highest sort of cognitive ability of humanity, right? Like, like, you know, the Greeks have come up with ideals that are worthy of reproducing, you know, the, 
the, sen the justice being blind, for example, you know, and stuff like that. And uh, so human philosophical thought is, is profound in many, many ways, but it's still done from a place of humanistic vanity. So let's see if I can bring all this together. So Paul's argument against the Jews is, is that they're more like the Greeks than they think because they've basically tried to reduce the law, which is the righteousness of God, to a set of rules that people can apply and enforce and then award those who keep the law better than others and punish those who don't keep it as well. You know, like, like by, so by being separated from society, well, you're unclean, so you can't be part of society. You are superior. So in a way, you can't be part of society either, but society could wait on you. <clears throat> and if you're unclean, then the society doesn't give you the time of day. And that's what the Jews were doing. And that's a secular humanistic ideal. And so Paul is trying like crazy to demonstrate to the people in the church in Rome and throughout his Asian ministry and his, his uh, uh, ministry in Judea and, and the realm of, of the Roman Empire. Like he's throughout this entire time, he's trying to say, God has a central purpose that is rooted in the fact that he is righteousness. And for righteousness sake, he sent his son to satisfy the need that righteousness demands. And then for the sake of the son, he redeems the people who reject God's righteousness anyway. And this is Paul's central theme. And then what he's trying to say to the Jews by way of example is, you see these Gentiles that you think you're so much better than? You're not. They're embracing God's righteousness in a way that you can't conceive of because you're so sure that you're right. And you basically are self-declaring that you're the righteousness because you are the keepers of the law, because you're the ones who write it down and rewrite it and, and perpetuate these, these standards that you've applied that can only be understood through secular humanist eyes. And so Paul's trying to say to them, real righteousness is found in Jesus Christ. And these Gentiles are more willing to recognize that and more able to be confirmed and converted by that than you are. And so, you know, everything's backward. Everything's completely backward. You think that you're better than the Greeks or the, the Gentiles because you are the people of the law. But in fact, you've turned the law into the very thing that you associate with the Greeks and the Gentiles. And you are, in fact, the ones who are dealing in the world of vanity and sanity. And so he's trying to make them see that. He's trying to make them understand that, that, that uh, there's no righteousness in the things we do or don't do or which way we turn when we pray and, you know, and, and on and on and on. I mean, there's no righteousness in that. And it's easier to convert somebody who worships some demonic being than it is to convert someone who claims to worship the God of Israel. And, you know, if that doesn't play in Indiana in 2024, I don't know what does. Because how many times have you and I talked on air and off about how much we see that in our own community? People who are devoted to their religion and devoted to the culture that has been created around that religion within the particular community. So that there are whole sources of rationalization and justification that have nothing to do with the true righteousness of God and the redemption that comes through Christ, but rather the righteousness through shared traditions and our mutual agreement about each other's goodness. Well, I go to the fish fry every Friday during Lent, and so do you. That makes us both righteous. And no, I'm not picking on Catholics. I mean, I'm just saying, for example, 
that's what we're like. Uh, let's talk about Baptists and Methodists and say, well, you don't drink beer and I don't drink beer. Therefore, we're righteous. And all those people who drink beer are unrighteous. Well, then we're not any better than the Jews in Jesus's day or Paul's day. And that's Paul's point. You know, and the, and the magnificence of the book of Romans is, is that we could just as easily be calling it the book of North America or the book of Western civilization in 2024. Because essentially Paul's writing to Westerners who among them are Jews and Christians and they're confused and conflicted and he's just as hard on the Christians. Believe me, he's saying to the Christians, you've embraced the gospel and I commend you for that, but you have also taken it right back to where you work and live and tried to adapt it to your secular Roman worldview. And I'm telling you, these things are unchanging. They're the same yesterday, today, and always. That's the 44-ton wrecking ball that's sitting in the middle of the room that you can't move. It is what it is and always will be. And it doesn't change whether you're a Christian who's trying to adapt your faith to secular worldviews or whether you're a Jew who's trying to adapt your faith to secular worldviews. Okay, that was a pretty good rant. Yeah. That was good stuff. I, I liked the point that you made about like, kind of like the crowd effect, <clears throat> I guess. Um, I've talked with my teens about this before. Like just because your friends are doing something and, and they all say that it's okay, doesn't mean that it's okay. Yeah. It doesn't mean that it's right. And so we, we live in a culture where the vast majority worships a certain way and does all of these things. And it's like, just because most people do that doesn't doesn't mean that it's right. Like, let's look at the heart of God. Let's ask ourselves, are we truly seeking the heart of God? Or are we seeking sin that's in our own heart? We know it's there. I mean, everybody has sin. We were, we were born sinful. Um, but it's so important to take a good hard look at your life and the decisions you make and, and why you're making those decisions and mm -hmm. who you're serving. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, I've taken a particular tack with this that's built around the central themes of Romans. Um, you know, we finished the series with his final uh, exhortation to deal with discord. And I'm not trying to steer this in that direction as much as make another point that I hope I get to in, in his asking or demanding that you deal firmly with discord he's trying to say that it's these little things that tear you apart that that there's strength in numbers and in this case he means there's righteous strength in numbers that we have a better chance of maintaining a personal holiness when we do it in communion with others because we urge each other on and this is something you hear him saying in other places that that there's this 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 realization that unity is part of the key to personal holiness so you know the people who say i don't need to be a t part of a church you know because they're all hypocrites and besides i can be close to god anywhere well the truth is is you have a better chance of being close to god in community with other people who are trying to be close with god because they're moving closer at one moment and pulling you closer because you're with them. And one minute you're moving closer when they're not so close and you're pulling them with you that, that we, we have, you know, this natural, uh, collective unity around our personal holiness. Um, meaning that everybody gets holier when they do it with others, you know, and not by the law, but by faith. And so our collective faith, and you could put this another way, you know, in a crowd that's facing something, you know, like I see, you see this in the movies all the time, right? You know, they're, all the people are standing there watching the tidal wave and then it dawns on them when it's a little too late that they should probably start running now. Well, you know, if they aren't standing further away they might notice other people who have already decided it's time to go and so in a way being a rugged independent person puts you at much greater risk of not surviving the storm but when you recognize that the people around you who have 
equal them equal common sense to you you know they're kind of recognizing what's going on i don't know if this metaphor is working very well but but the idea is really simple it's like it's like a crowd can either be a mob that's panicking you know or a crowd can be a group of people discerning together what the best response to a particular situation is by yourself it's you deciding whether you're going to panic or whether you're going to deal with this in a certain way and you know that's when you'd kind of like to have collective wisdom right you know is when when it's a really hard decision so my purpose in the analogy is to say that that paul has very clear reasons for pushing us to have unity in the body because unity makes us stronger as individuals and it bears witness to christ in a way that's thousand times more powerful than an individual testimony then discord has a way of not only disrupting any type of unity that could exist but it tends to be destructive too it, it's not just um separation it's destructive it it tears down you know and and so you know when we look at christian community from the context of the book of romans what we recognize is, is that he's he's trying to say form yourselves around core truths and the core truth that is above and beyond all is god's righteousness the core truth is is that god has redeemed us despite our unrighteousness through his son for the sake of his son and he's empowered us with the holy spirit so that collectively we are embracing an even greater expression of the Holy Spirit, which makes greater power to do good and to honor God possible. I was saying to somebody this morning uh, in a different conversation in an entirely different context that I was talking about pastors who can really get churches going. But as soon as the pastor is gone, the church crashes and burns and never seems to be the same again. And I said, my goal as a pastor is not to be a lightning bolt, but to be a power plant, you know? Yeah. Because a lightning bolt can do all of that, but then it's gone. But a power plant, if you do it right, is going to keep going and keep generating the juice that keeps things flowing. And in the same way, unity in the body of Christ is like having this constant source of spiritual power where individuality in the body of Christ is just a lot of individual lightning bolts. You know, they zap something and they go away. And so this is, I think, why, you know, listening to Paul's instruction to the church in Rome, he's, he's basically giving wisdom and advice for Christians who are part of a global system because Rome is the global system of the day, right? Right. The internet is their boats, you know, the internet is their always marching armies because messages get transferred through these means, you know, and communication happens because there are safe means of travel in every direction, Roman roads and Roman seaways. And, and so, you know, he's basically equipping the church with a message that can be transferred broadly. And, uh, well, I told you I had a point that I was trying to get to, but I'm not sure what it was now. But I think it was just, you know, my hope was that people could understand that that uh, that the Christian worldview is in many ways not complicated. But it does require you to make sense of the world in a, in a way that will in many times oppose what your worldly sense tells you, you know? So, so as I was talking with their, our friend Katrina the other day and I, and I was saying, you know, I'm kind of a slave to logic. I like logic and reason, which some people would say doesn't seem to fit a Christian very well, but that's really not true because logic and reason have everything to do with your worldview. You know, if your worldview is the world, if you look at the world and you see gravity as being a constant, 
then it doesn't matter how many times you watch the ball get thrown up in the air, you know it's always going to come back down. So a Christian worldview is like that. You just have accepted certain rules to be true, which means that you do all sorts of things that actually seem very logical to you from the Christian worldview. They just don't seem logical to people outside the Christian worldview. Um, but the downside is, is that there are, uh, people of other religious traditions whose worldview says that it's perfectly logical for them to, to commit acts of terror that kill thousands of innocent people, you know, because in their world, that's logical. So logic and reason have everything to do with what informs them. And so we're back to this idea of the difference between the secular worldview or the Greek worldview and and the Judeo-Christian worldview. You know, what is logic and reasonable, what is logical and reasonable has everything to do with who informs your interpretation of logical and reasonable. Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you, you certainly got me thinking. Um, I'm over here actually thinking about the movie Don't Look Up. Have you seen that? Yes. Yeah. And so that's just, for me, a perfect example of what happens when there's not unity towards a universal truth. Yeah. There's chaos and ultimate destruction. Um, If you haven't seen that movie, watch it. Um, It's a little bit hyperbolic, but not so much that it's not scary. Um, There's these two scientists who discover that a comet, huge, massive, mountain-sized comet, is going to destroy planet Earth, and nobody believes them. And, um, yeah, sure, I'll just spoil the movie for you. Nobody believes them. There's, like, mass hysteria, basically, towards the end when they finally look up and say, oh, my goodness, they were right. And then, the whole world explodes. And if they had just believed them and the countries had worked together, they could have nuked this thing or shot huge missiles at it and like blown it up basically to prevent the destruction of planet earth. Um, and so like there was logic there, right. But they, they wouldn't see the truth. And I mean, the, there is ultimate truth, right? It's not, we live in a culture where it's like, oh, well, that's your truth. And this is my truth. No, there's universal truth. Truth is not relative. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like that just drives me nuts when people say that. And there is a universal truth and the universal truth is the gospel. Yeah. We're, we're about to have dare to share coming up with the kids and they share a very easy way to share the gospel. And so they take each letter of the word gospel and there's a phrase with it. And I'm going to try to say it without any notes. But they said, gee, God created us to be with him. Oh, our sins separate us from God. S, sin cannot be removed by good deeds. P, paying the price for sin, Jesus died and rose again. E, everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. And L, life with God uh, starts now and lasts forever. And Good job. Th- thank you. And that's just like the I'd, simple. I'd clap, but I can't. You can't. Don't clap. Please don't. Your thumb <laughs> will not be happy with you. Um, uh, <laughs> surgery. Yeah, anyway. I'm, I'm wrapped in a cast on my right hand here. Yeah, but, but there is universal truth. There is a God. He is the one God. Yeah. And we should worship him. And life with him is so much better. So much better than life without him. So yeah. if you're not following him with your whole heart, do it do it yeah i you know i just i love stories and storytelling and metaphors and everything and i think the don't look up movie is a really good story of the true nature of humanity under the chaos and oppression of satan mm-hmm. um because the the when i watched that movie i thought yeah that's how it's gonna go i mean it we we love the movies where the presidents are heroic people who lead the nations towards defeating a f- you know alien enemy or whatever, but it ain't gonna happen. No, it's not gonna happen. You know, um, this is why Paul says we have to in the Christian body go out of our way to to fend off discord because it's like as it. 
it's like kudzu in the south. If you if <laughs> yeah. you aren't constantly cutting away the kudzu, it will just overgrow everything. And that's the true nature of sin. That's the true nature of the fallen world. It's inevitable. It's like when a house is abandoned on your street. It's does it takes 6 months to, for that house to start falling apart. And to start getting overgrown with vines and everything. And those vines have a way of tearing even more things apart. And, and it's like you just, it requires constant maintenance in order for the body of Christ to thrive. And it's because we are empowered by God's righteousness and God's salvation through Jesus Christ, which opens the way for God's spirit to infuse everything we do but for now we do it within this fallen world and and it's well the apostle paul uses a term that i'm going to paraphrase roughly which is that you know then i'll see clearly right now i see through a fog you know right now the glass is a little bit smeared but then the glass will be gone and I will be able to see clearly. And that's kind of the nature of our condition right now. We're, we're going to have to strive for righteousness every day, not for righteousness in ourselves, but for righteousness sake, you know, for, for, because God is righteousness. That's the truth. That is the irrefutable truth that he is the truth. And, and I think one of the greatest lies that Satan has been able to perpetuate in the human condition is this sense that God is somehow separate from all of this, that God is distant, that God isn't engaged and God isn't, and, and what God wants from us, what I think is the absolute heart and soul of the biblical Christian worldview is that God is central, that, that, that God that that God isn't distant from us. We're distant from God, you know, like, like God is central that, that the heart and soul of everything that is, was, and ever will be is God. And therefore truth is what God says. Truth is no, God is truth. <laughs> truth yeah. is not just what God says it is. Truth is because God is. You know, mm -hmm. the, the love of God is love. That's why the Bible says God is love because we don't understand love unless we really understand that God is love, you know, and to say God's name is in effect to say love the very, you know, it it's, you know, and what's the point? Okay. I don't know that I can really, I'm just you know, I'm looking around the room trying to find the words in the ether somewhere. The point is that we're, we're never, we're never, at least until we're made whole, we're never going to be able to really grasp the things that we're flirting with verbally. But try to grasp it anyway, because you're closer to righteousness when you try, you know. It's, it's when you stop trying to grasp the nature of your creator and the unimaginable essence of his love for you. You know, I mean, to, to, to say that God sent his son to save the world from sin and to take that down to its core and say, Jesus who is God, the flesh, the son in the flesh. It's God in the flesh, hanging on a cross. And when he's hanging on this cross, he's not only dying to his, his flesh is not only being tortured and killed, but his soul is being killed. The very soul of the, of God, the very heart of who God is, the very essence of God. That's what the word means in the Bible, where it describes that, Jesus as the word with a capital W in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. And, you know, and, I, and, and that's what it means. It's like God's very essence is hanging on the cross and God's allowing that to happen. He's allowing God's enemy to have his way with him for a time. 
in order to satisfy something cosmic that's beyond our comprehension, but we are utterly dependent on this act for our eternal existence. And all of this is happening, and at that moment, he's thinking of you. He's thinking of Adrian. He's thinking of Dan. He's thinking of you, listener. He's thinking of you. And and to take that, incomprehensibly enormous being and dumb it down to the fact of a person hanging on a cross embodying that being and thinking this is for you Dan this is for you Adrian because you're worth it and I want you with me forever and ever and ever and this is just the beginning <laughs> wow Cold chills. Yeah. Mm. Well, chew on that, listener. Some good stuff. <laughs> yeah. Probably a good place to stop. Probably. Thanks well, for listening. Yeah. Thank you for listening. You know, drop us a line. We'd love to hear from you. You know what the algorithm told me the other day, Adrian? It told no me idea. that we got 500 and something downloads in Iran. Wow, thank you, uh, Iran. I, I suspect think. a bot. There probably is a bot. <laughs> yeah. Those are large numbers for us. Yeah. yeah. I I'm I'm suspicious of that number. So you know what? If you're listening in for real in Iran, drop us a note because we think the algorithm is being lied to by, you know, it's computers talking to each other and trying to trick each other. That's what it sounds like to me. So, you know, when we see reports that you're downloading, you know, sometimes we'll get notes, we'll get reports that tell us we get like 632 downloads from Connecticut, you know, and you're like, are there 632 people living in Connecticut? I'm just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But, <laughs> but seriously, you know, I, you just know there's something wrong with that number. Yeah. And so one of the reasons that I occasionally beg you to drop us a note and, and let us know you're really listening from wherever you're listening is just because just once in a while, it would be so gratifying to find out that you're really out there, you know, but uh, that would also assume that you hung on this long and actually stayed till this part of the podcast. So maybe we should ask at the beginning of the podcast for a change. <laughs> Well, maybe this is a test, and if you've made it this far, you can prove it to us that you've made it this far by sending us a note that says, I'm not a robot. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. We would appreciate that. That'd be awesome. <laughs> you get a gold star you. if you do that. All right. Have a good week. Bye.